I'm a little annoyed. I'm mostly super excited, but I'm also a little annoyed. You know how I've been working on my own tabletop role-playing system? Yeah, about that. Greetings, citizens of Nerdicopia. I'm your princess, Judith. So, it's been a while, but you may remember how in the last couple of videos, I've been teasing, very unsubtly, that I've been developing my own system for role-playing. It's called DREAM, which is 100% a backronym, and it stands for Diverse Role-Playing Engine and Adventuring Mechanics. It's meant to be a very rules-light system, so you can explain it in like 5 minutes, make a character, and get playing. Even with players who have never played any kind of tabletop role-playing game in their life. It's also a genre and setting agnostic, so you can literally roleplay any kind of story you want. Also, it has a bunch of GM emulation mechanics, meaning you can play it without any preparation, and you don't even need a game master. And you can in fact play it solo. So I've been working on that for a while, and I am genuinely quite proud of it. I got it to the point where I just had to playtest it with actual people, before I can complete it and put it out to the world. Me being me, that of course still hasn't happened, but despite everything, I do still want to do that at some point. The thing is, I recently came across something that does pretty much all of that, but better. It's called Two-Sided Roleplaying by Le Trip Fantastique. I'm not going to talk too much about how to play it, because frankly, it's not my place to do so. All I'll say is that it's one page, you only have two stats, and everything is done with a single coin. It is available for free on DriveThruRPG. I'll leave a link where the links go. I highly recommend it. The point is that two-sided roleplaying genuinely does exactly what Dream was designed to do, but way better. Except I do have something to add. I have a couple of notes on not what the rules mean, but how I interpret them. Or at least how I use them. Number one, how does your character get killed? The rules say that they are killed very easily, but they don't really say how. They do say how you, you kill an enemy, so I can only assume that that also applies to your character. So normally, unless the character is more vulnerable than a regular hero, I just assume that they can take a wound and then two hits before they are killed. Number two, do your stats regenerate? Like, when you make a check, you can use the points in your stats to try again. But I'm not sure if that means that those expended points are just gone forever, or do you get them back after the check? Because in most RPGs, your stats and modifiers affect your checks, but they don't change. For example, tossing your coin three times is equivalent to rolling three dice in Gateway Roleplay. But in Gateway, and also in Dream, actually, you don't lose those dice for future checks. So I would think that it works the same for this. But the text kind of implies that you do lose them. So that's how I'll play for now. Number three, items. Per the rules, you start with two items and down the line you can have up to four. And if they influence your check, you can get an extra attempt. The thing is, I don't tend to be quite that materialistic in my character creation. Like, items can be cool and interesting, but I prefer not to be tied to them. So I try to stick with items, but I am inclined to be flexible about it. And I allow myself to give characters features, as I call it in Dream, instead. Features are just something that defines your character and makes them who they are, and what they're good at. So that can be their training or upbringing, something that their genealogy allows them to do, that the people around them can't. I just think that gives a little more freedom in character creation. Number four, I've noticed that if you want balanced combat, action economy is super duper important. One of the first time I played, I had three heroes fighting a boss, and well, they beat them very quickly. 
admittedly, I was lucky with my tosses, but still. If you don't want combat to be over quite so easily, be aware to add enough enemies to fight, or give enemies multiple actions or something. Just be aware of the action economy. Number 5. Coins. This is a big one. Obviously, this game is played with a single coin, but that doesn't mean you need to use a coin. Essentially what it is, is a d2, a two-sided dice. And this is something I also did in Dream, where checks are made with up to 5 d2s. I did that on purpose, because it means you can use dice, but you can also use playing cards, tarot, coins, dominoes. I've actually used knuckle bones at one point. The point is, you don't need to use a coin. You can pull a card. If it's red, you succeed. If it's black, you fail. Just define what constitutes a success and what doesn't. For tarot, a success is all of the major arcana, one full suit, I use pentacles or coins, and the remaining aces. And that actually works for tarot decks too. For dice, a success is any dice that rolls more than half, like for a d12, anything above a 6 but not 6 itself, etc. That versatility is something that Dream was designed around, but it absolutely applies here as well. Heck, you can just use your pen. It has two sides. I consider catching it with the points towards me a success, and away from me is a fail, but just make sure you predefine it. Number 6. Game Master Emulation the one thing that Dream has, and that two-sided roleplaying doesn't, is GM emulation mechanics. Obviously, when you're playing with a group, I recommend just working together to come up with ideas. I will say that means that if you play in some established canon, or in history, any accuracy will depend entirely on the knowledge of the group. So if you want to play a Regency romance, and you don't have any historians in the group, just accept that it won't be entirely accurate. In fact, even if you do have historians, they're not walking encyclopedias. The point is, when you play alone, or your group just needs a little bit of help coming up with ideas, that's when you can use this stuff. And the thing is, reading two-sided roleplaying, and also just having you stream mechanics for a bit, make me realize that I probably definitely overcomplicated it, which is ironic because it was meant to be really simple. Anyway, I reworked them to work with just a coin and to be, you know, actually simple. In fact, it's so simple now that some of it is so blindingly obvious that you'll wonder why I included it. For completeness, that's why. So, how do you replace a game master with a couple of coin tosses? There's about five mechanics you need to know. Mechanic number one is the oracle. In solo roleplay, an oracle refers to some kind of mechanic where you can get answers to any yes or no question. So how do you do that with just a coin? Just toss the coin. Heads means yes, tails means no. If you think something is very likely or unlikely, just don't toss. Mechanic number two are triggers. In the Solo Adventurer's Toolbox by Paul Wimler, this is known as the 6d12 method. Basically, whenever you enter a new location or situation, you roll 6d12, and each represents a different thing that may or may not be triggered, be present. In this case, we just ask three questions. Are there NPCs? Are there notable items? Is there some kind of event happening? And then you just ask the oracle, aka a coin toss, to see if they trigger. This doesn't tell you anything about how many people, friend or foe, what kind of item, or what is happening. So, you use additional questions to find out. And to be clear, in this context, an item doesn't mean an artifact. It can be anything physical, like statues or engravings in the wall, or anything. Likewise, an event doesn't have to mean something organized, like a festival. It can just be a conflict between NPCs, 
or a glass breaking or something. After you know what triggers in the area, you can use the rest of the mechanics to specify what you find. Mechanic number three is NPCs. Before deciding anything mechanical, use the context and maybe some additional questions to figure out who they actually are. From there, it probably doesn't take much to see what their items or features should be. To decide the stats, you can just toss the coin six times. Heads is a point for wits, tails is a point for muscles. Or just decide it for yourself, based on who they are. Mechanic number four is populating the location. I'm not talking about the people, that's covered by triggers. I mean the interior. What do you see? Well, just toss your coin. Heads means there's something inside the room, like furniture or an ornament of sorts. That doesn't have to be something meant as furniture. Like if you're in a forest, there may be logs you can sit on, and that counts as furniture in this context. An ornament can be anything from like a carving or a statue to torches. Tails means there's something to do with outside of the area, like a pretty view or a passage to somewhere, a door, which is also a passage, or a ventilation hole. So once you know which of the two it is, you just use the oracle again to ask, is it this? Is it this? Until you know what it is. And you can do that until you feel the room is sufficiently full. And of course, you put it all together as you go. Like if you get that there is a basin in a room, and also a passage to somewhere else, they don't have to be separate. The passage can be in the water. Mechanic number five are keys or keywords. Keys is a syllable faster. Keys are used to answer any open questions that the normal oracle can't answer. There's a couple of options and depending on your situation, one might be preferable over the other. The first option is to not use extra mechanics and just fill it in as you wish. And that is something you'll have to do anyway. And it's important to remember that the only goal is to have fun. So especially in solo play, where you're the only player, do what you want. The problem with that approach, especially if that's your only approach, is that you're limited to what you can come up with. And so it can get predictable and repetitive. When you're playing with a group and everyone chips in, which I highly recommend, that's less of a problem. But when you play alone, you'll probably want some prompts or keys. So usually the solution is to have a huge list of words and then you roll or something to get your word. And that is a valid technique. In fact, I did it as well for Dream. But for a system like this, that's just not practical. You'd have to toss 10 times for a single key. And you'd need to actually have the reference list on you. So we're not doing that. I'll go over my solution in a moment. But first I want to quickly share some other techniques I've come across. One is to use tarot cards if you have them, or some other kind of divination. There is a resource called the Game Designer's Tarot, which goes over how you can use tarot as a GM tool. Link where links go. Or you can just interpret the cards as you normally would. Or just look at the pictures for inspiration and apply it to your story. And that concept can to some extent also be applied to other kinds of divination. Another option is to have some books nearby that are in the genre that you're playing. Like if I'm playing fantasy, I might have the works of Tolkien, or just out of spite, I might have the D&D books. If I'm telling a Regency romance, I'd have the works of Jane Austen, etc. So then you can just open it at a random page and just pick a word without looking. But those still require you to have a tarot deck or the books or something with you. And if you're playing an impromptu game on the beach, that's not really going to be the case. So is there something you can do with just a coin? Of course there is. It's essentially the same as we did for the location. Basically you make some tosses to narrow down what you're looking for, and then just try to come up with something and ask, 
Is that it? Until that's it. I will admit that this way of determining things takes quite a bit longer than it would with just a rolling table. The thing is that rolling tables with a d2 are either kind of pointless or very laborious. And if you want to play impromptu, you just won't have the tables available, probably. And I have noticed that doing it this way is actually quite interesting, because you can fill it in with what you think is likely, but that may not be the case at all. I feel like it's a good compromise between doing all the work yourself and having the dice generate it all. So how do you narrow it down to begin with? The first toss, heads means whatever it is has to do with an NPC. Tails means it has to do with some kind of secret or clue. Neither of these necessarily have anything to do with your character or what they're doing. It could be completely unrelated. And that's the next question. Does it have anything to do with us? Next you can, you don't have to, ask if this is good for our character or is it bad? It could be neither. And none of that actually tells you what it actually is. But it does narrow down your scope. It gives some direction. And from there you can just free associate, look around, think of stories you like, think of your own life, etc. to come up with some keywords or just concepts. From there you just have to decide if you want to just use what you thought of or you can ask the oracle if that's it. I think that's kind of it for Game Master emulation. Of course, if you have additional suggestions, let me know down below. Before I wrap up, I want to briefly talk about solo roleplay. I don't want to go into why you'd want to do it, because honestly, I'm not entirely sure why I like it. I just know that I do. I do want to go into how you can do it, or at least how I do it. There's a bunch of ways to go about it. You can just look on YouTube. But not all of those will be equally suited for the game that you want to play, or work with the two-sided system. But if you want a roleplay focused, story driven game, to me, this is great. The fun part is that you don't have to write down anything. You can play entirely in theater of a mind. That being said, I myself tend to have a very autorial approach, meaning I will do some roleplay, work out what's happening, and then I write it out in prose. Rinse and repeat until conclusion. In fact, I'll usually use the right page for my prose, and the left page is for my notes, keys, possible maps, anything mechanical I want to note. One more thing I want to highlight is the concept of threads. Threads are separate storylines or goals that your character can pursue. Also, a side note, for solo play, you should probably have at least two player characters. If you're only playing a one-shot, goals are less important, but it can still be useful to formulate a goal for your characters, because that's going to push them to actually do stuff, which makes things happen. When I say a goal, I don't mean something like doing their job. I mean like, why do they want to do their job? Is there anything specific that could motivate adventure? But threats aren't just goals. It's any evolving situation that may or may not be connected to other situations, but will definitely change over time and be meaningful to your characters. It's stuff like a sick mother, an evil twin hatching some scheme, a runaway cat. You get the idea. I'd say it's not really necessary to really do anything with these threats, like mechanically. Just keep track of their evolution and even that's only necessary if you care to pursue it. Anyway, I'd say just make a list and keep updating it. But that's about all I can say about all this. Which brings me to the YouTube thing. You know the drill, everything you can do to help the channel is in the end screen right here. Any additions to what I've been talking about are of course welcome down below. If you don't know what to comment, how about this? 
What do you think of the idea of solo roleplay? Do you hate it? Actually, don't tell me if you hate it. Nobody cares. Do you like it? Will you try it? Have you tried it already? Share all your stories down below. I'm not sure when or what the next video will be. At, at this point it is very possible that it's already the Christmas special, but we'll see. For now, thanks for watching.